I'd like to call the September meeting of the Board of Regents to order. Before we get to our roll call, I'd like to make a small change in the agenda today. I'd like to call on Dr. Rallo to make a presentation as part of the commissioner's remarks, which will, uh, we will continue uh, as printed on the agenda at a later time. But for right now, I would like to turn the meeting over to Dr. Rallo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to make a, a special presentation. And we're pleased uh, to recognize a gentleman who demonstrated support for higher education and workforce preparation throughout his life's work, uh, Mr. Kurt Isink. And I'm going to read portions of a proclamation in his honor. Uh, whereas Kurt Isink served as the state of Louisiana as the executive director of the Louisiana Workforce Commission from 2009 to 2016. And whereas Kurt Isink committed his efforts to preserving and continuing to improve the state's public workforce system, aligning human capital with current and emerging economies, investing in Louisiana's future workforce, promoting the Louisiana occupational forecast and star job system as national models, and ensuring that the people of Louisiana have an opportunity to get good jobs. And whereas Kurt Isink distinguished himself as a leader among his workforce peers around the country, ascending to the office of president of the National Association of State Workforce Agencies unopposed, and receiving a national award for his work, and whereas Kurt Eisting consistently demonstrated his staunch support for Louisiana education at all levels in general and public post-secondary education in particular, including being a champion of the Department of Education's Jumpstart program and serving on numerous state committees and commissions, including the Wise Council for Higher Education, and whereas he exhibited an enduring spirit of cooperation and partnership, actively serving as a member of the Board of Regents Stakeholder Collaborative, provided input on the revised outcome-based form funding formula, contributed to the focus groups which led to Elevate Louisiana, and advocated for higher education as a public good. And whereas Kurt Ising continued his commitment to higher education and workforce preparation when he left the Louisiana Workforce Commission by joining the Louisiana Community and Technical College System, where he made strides to promote, support, improve, and advance the role of community and technical college in the state. Now, therefore, be resolved that the Louisiana Board of Regents does hereby recognize and commend the work and celebrate the life and legacy of Kurt Isink for his exemplary service to the state of Louisiana, his unyielding pledge to the public post-secondary education and workforce readiness in the state and nationally, and be it further resolved that in recognition of his commitment to improving education and workforce development in the state of Louisiana, we do hereby dedicate its support fund endowed two-year workforce scholarship subprogram in memory of Kurt Isink and extended our profound gratitude to his wife, Dion Nodier Isink, his children, Samantha, Maxwell, and Adelaide, his parents, Ute and Billy Isink, brothers, Paul and Conrad, and the entire Isink Nation for sharing Kurt with Louisiana and the higher education community. And at this time, I'd like the, the family to come up to receive the proclamation. And I'd like Chairman Lipsey to present the proclamation in the front.
want to say thank you very much on behalf of our children, Maxwell, Samantha and Adelaide, and Kurt's parents, Uta and Billy, who couldn't be here today. And on behalf of our entire huge family who love Kurt, I met Kurt, we were both in our early 20s working at The Advocate, and he was tall and handsome, he had this cute accent, and he had this Magnum P.I. mustache that, uh, that Chris Broadwater later ruined for me by calling it Mr. Bean. Um, but what I really fell in love with was Kurt's boldness and his honesty and his ethics. And I, felt, I fell in love with the confident way that he could just cut through baloney and get straight to the heart of the matter. And we had been dating a little while when one day I said, you know, Kurt, I really like you. And he said, in his Kurt accent, using words that I would never use, he said, bullshit, you love me and I love you. <laughs> and, and that was the first time he told me he loved me. Because he just had a way of spotting BS and he had a really low tolerance for it. And if you knew him at all, you knew that he had a really high tolerance for cussing, so. <laughs> um, Kurt did live in several countries growing up, but Louisiana was his true home. And he was driven less by a paycheck and more by the idea that he could have a job that would do something that would help make his home a better place. And Tim Parfield saw Kurt's potential and brought him on to the Louisiana Workforce Commission. And then Bobby Jindal believed in him enough to keep him there. And it was there that I saw Kurt just catch on fire with the idea that they could really make a difference in somebody's life by giving them access to jobs so that they could stay here in Louisiana and support their families. And I had an insider's view of his passion from his early morning phone calls with Charles Magnon um, <laughs> to late nights just for hours typing furiously on this little work tablet that he had and loved to the many times that innocent cousins or friends would ask him about what's going on in Louisiana, only to grievously regret their error after <laughs> <laughs> like 30 minutes of his passionate response. <laughs> but he would come home after work and park at the top of our driveway and you know finish up phone calls. And I could hear him just laughing his head off. And that's because he just loved it. And he loved working with all of you and you gave him the opportunity of his lifetime, and you trusted him, and you supported him, and you argued with him, and you challenged him, and you believed in him, and you made him just shout with laughter in our driveway in his truck. He was honored to call you colleagues and friends. So it's very important for us to thank you for this humongous honor, and thank you for keeping his, his memory alive. We're extremely grateful. Again, thank you so much for allowing us to honor Kurt today and uh, deserves all the accolades and more and we will miss him sorely as I know you do. M Mr. Chairman, if, if I could have one, one minute to thank this family for Kurt. Because as I'm Roy Martin, I'm President and CEO of Royal Martin Marco LLC, Indigo Minerals uh, for Forex for our services and Marco LLC. We literally hired hundreds of people under his watch. He elevated their lives and made their lives better. Thousands of other Louisianians have benefited from his life. Thank you very much and God bless. Okay, at this time uh, we'll have roll call and then we will open up the public comments. Uh, Carolyn, would you please call the roll? Yes, sir. Regent Adley? Here. Regent Chabert? Here. Regent Davi? Here. Regent Henning? Here. Regent Levy? Here. Regent Lipsy? Here. Regent Markle? Here. Regent Martin? Here. Regent McDonald? Here. Regent Meyer? Regent Perez? Regent Pryor? Here. Regent Seal? Here. Regent Temple? Here. Regent Williams? Here. Regent Wyatt? Here. We do have a quorum. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, I'd like to ask for any public comments and start with uh, uh, Mr. Stephen Wagusback. Would you like to come forward, please, sir? Okay, 
Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, members of the board, very much. I'll be very brief uh, with my comments. My, uh, first, I just want to say um, thank you very much for, for the honor you put upon this man. Um, I, I would tell you that the, the true, you know, best um, asset of Kurt was there was no one better in the world to have a burger and a beer with. I mean, that guy was entertaining, he was charming, he was funny, he was smart. You walked away with your, with your belly hurting because of laughter and also your brain full with good ideas. Um, he was motivational. Um, all those things you want to hear about people. But I would tell you one thing about Kurt is that, um, you know, he was very successful in a lot of political enterprises. And I think it was because he detested politics. He, when, we would, when we would come across an issue together, he looked at arbitrary obstacles as the worst thing in the world. And as you all know, because in your role in public service, you come across ideas and you want to implement them, but there are these little obstacles there. Maybe it's a, someone politically will get mad at you, or maybe there's some division of ownership because of some decision years ago, or some board has committee, or some commission has you know, jurisdiction, and there's all these little arbitrary obstacles everywhere. And Kurt was so good at recognizing them and either putting together a collaborative approach to work through them or firing up the bulldozer and running over them. <laughs> and on any given day, it was a different you know, you know, club he would pull out of the bag. And he was so good at that skill set. He was all about the end result. And his end result was this. We can educate kids all day long, but if we don't make sure that they can go get a fulfilling job to where they can stay here, invest here, and grow their family here, we're not really doing our job. And so I would encourage you, as you work through complex policy issues, um, channel your inner Kurt as much as you can. When you see those arbitrary obstacles, which seem like a big deal, but quite frankly, may be overcome with a good meeting or a good bulldozer, channel your inner Kurt. I think if you really want to talk about the legacy he leaves, it is if we all, as members who have our own piece of public service one way or another, whether it's volunteer or not, we look for those moments to not let arbitrary obstacles get in your way of improving the lives of Louisiana kids. And that's what he did each and every day. And I know I like to think I'm a better um, uh, public participant, but also a person because of knowing him. And I hope getting to know a little bit more about him, you all have the same takeaway. So thank you very much for this honor on behalf of those that knew and, and worked with him. So thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate it very much. Uh, David Havelson, Hav would I'm sure. sorry, thank David. You. Havelson, thank you, board members, you like Chairman Lipsy. Commissioner Rallo, uh, David Helveston, Chief External Affairs Officer at LCTCS. And I'm going to say a few words and then cue up, I think, a video from Dr. Sullivan, who very much wanted to be here today, but, but who's out of state. Um, I had the opportunity to, to both work directly for Kurt at, at the Workforce Commission and then to work alongside Kurt at LCTCS. And, you know, over those years, Kurt became a, a true mentor and uh, a, a very close friend. And I think I see, you know, a lot of coworkers out there that, that would say the same. I think anybody that worked with Kurt became friends with Kurt. He was a great guy to go have a burger and a beer with, no doubt, and, and had many burgers and beers with Kurt. You know, I think folks have touched on a lot of things that Kurt did. I think his ability to, his passion for serving others, to, to cut through the, the BS, whether it's talking about love or, or talking about, you know, higher education policy, that's what Kurt really brought to me, is was that drive and passion and unending you know, determination to get things done. And whether that's taken on, you know, bureaucratic state agencies, if it's taken on colleges, universities, if it's pushing the Board of Regents, he wasn't afraid to push the Board of Regents and their staff. And, and I think because of that, you know, Kurt would be so flattered by this honor to hear the Board of Regents honoring Kurt in this way. And he'd have some, some wonderful lines in his funny accent about the Board of Regents honoring me. Um, but, but I think it's so very well deserved. So thank you for, for taking this action today, Board of Regents. And I'll say one thing. Our colleges have, have gotten together, the leadership, and said, we want to remember Kurt. We want to do our part. And so they've all committed. They're going to go out and raise those private funds. And so we'll be back to you in a few months with some privately raised funds to come to the new, newly named Kurt Ising, you know, support fund and ask that we set up a scholarship, an endowed scholarship at every one of our schools so that his legacy will live on throughout the state. It's very well deserved. So thank you, sir, uh, members. Thank you, David. Uh, Charles Magnot. Oh, wait, wait, and I think we, have a, we may have a video. Thank you. We have a little clip to show. All of us had the great honor and privilege of working with and getting to know Kurt Isink in his role as Executive Director of the Louisiana Workforce Commission and ultimately with the Louisiana Community and Technical College System. 
I am excited today to know that the Board of Regents will consider an item to name the Workforce Scholarship in honor of Kurt's memory and all of the great work that he did on behalf of the people of Louisiana. I encourage you to take this action today and do so knowing that you have the full support of Louisiana's community and technical colleges. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Wine, Good morning and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, I had the pleasure of serving as chairman of the Workforce Investment Council during Kurt's reign as executive director. And many of you I've worked with over the past few years, and the story I'm about to tell, many of you were on that journey with us. <coughs> I want to tell you a story about Kurt and higher ed. One year we passed out the uh, occupational forecast for that year, and we realized we had missed the mark. We were not reaching our users, our citizens. We were not reaching K-12, and we were not reaching you. And Kurt and Raj Jindal met with economic development groups around the state. They met with employers, and they spoke to both the educators in K-12 and the educators in higher ed. And we understood that we needed to change our methodology. We understood we needed to change, we needed to include current events, because there was a lot of things changing at that time. And in addition to current events, we needed to also look at what was going on in economic development. So one year later, we came before you, and we, and I can still remember that meeting, when we came here, and there was a lot of heads nodding from the Board of Regents, and there was a lot of acceptance as we talked about the new methodology, and we talked about a new concept called STAR Jobs. And STAR Jobs was going to be a new delivery system, a way for our citizens to be able to look at occupational forecast information very quickly and be able to understand where those high demand high wage occupations would be. But it also would give, from your insight, it would give the administrators of K-12 and higher ed a tool to use for greater alignment. And that was Kurt's main objective, is to have greater alignment between K-12, higher ed, with our workforce demands. You, with your insight, you lent to us one of your key staff piece, people and Dr. Lisa Bosworth. And over the course of the next few years, she would work with us to make sure that as we develop store jobs, that it would meet the needs of higher ed. You also had one of yours, Dr. King Alexander, as we sat on the WISE Council together, would challenge Kirk and I, because what Dr. Alexander was doing was he wanted it to not only stand the time of today, but he wanted to stand the time of the future. As administrations change, he wanted to have a system that could stand that time. So here we are today, we're tributing, playing tribute to Kurt. And I wanted his family to hear this because this was Kurt's goal. This alignment, this development of star jobs was done in conjunction with you and the other state agencies. And I spoke to him on both Thursday and then Saturday before the unfortunate event occurred that Monday. And we were talking about the journey. We were talking about the journey of store jobs. And we were talking about how engaged the Board of Regents was with us. And as others have said, he was a man of very few words. And when I, I just said to him, I said, Kurt, you should be very proud. And he said he was. Thank you very much. Dr. Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, in, uh, you can look back in history and find seminal moments that were started with legislation. And quite often there's a lot of fanfare around reform legislation and a lot of arguments, a lot of debates, and it passes and nothing changes. Well, in 2008, one of the first pieces of business was to completely reform 
the workforce development system in the state of Louisiana. And it passed. It was a product of vision that came from a number of sectors, from the governor's office to business and industry to the higher ed enterprises. We were all at that table and crafted this reform. And that would have been labeled a great legislative success. But what doesn't get sometimes the, the same amount of attention or the glory or the credit is the implementation of that reform. And there was nobody, nobody more responsible for the implementation of those 2008 reforms than Kurt Isaac. I hope it's a lesson that we all learn as we move forward in trying to create the state that we all desire, that leadership matters. And if you want a model of leadership, look no, look no further than Kurt Isaac, because his work will continue to benefit this state for generations to come. Thank you for honoring him today. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Are there any other uh, comments? I would, again, like to thank the Isaac family for being here today and offer our congratulations uh, to you, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you, gentlemen. We're now we'll uh, go ahead and uh, approve the minutes of the last meeting. Uh, I think you've all, board members, you've seen the minutes from the last meeting. Do I have a motion to approve Seven, the minutes Seven. of the August 23rd? Moved by second. Mr. Martin and Mr. Henning seconded. Any objection? Motion passes. Next, we'll move on to our committee reports and recommendations. Uh, at this time, we'll take up the committee reports together. Uh, however, I would like to make note that if any board member or anyone present wishes to take up any committee report separately, please let me know and we'll be happy to consider them individually. Is there anyone who would like to take any of the committee reports up separately? Hearing none, then we'll move on. Do I have a motion to approve all the committee recommendations that I think everyone was here for this morning? So moved. Moved by Mr. McDonald. Second. Seconded by Ms. Vines. Wyatt. Any yeah. questions? Wyatt. <laughs> yeah. Wyatt. I said Vines, Wyatt. Wyatt now. Oh, Wyatt, Wyatt, Wyatt. Oh, God. There you go. Robinson. Can't, can't leave Leonard out of the equation. I know. <laughs> Sorry about that, Jackie. And uh, any uh, objection to the motion? If not, motion passes. Uh, we'll now to move, move on to item seven, the report and recommendations from Dr. Rallo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, I have three uh, presentations, very brief ones, but I'd like to invite uh, Matthew Labriere and Dr. Subramanian to come up. And first, he will provide an update on the search process for the uh, commissioner of higher ed, and then Dr. Supermanian will follow and provide an update on the federal changes in ca uh, campus sexual assault guidelines, which I think are both important and evolving. So please, Matthew. Thank you, Dr. Rollo. Um, the RFP for the search committee has, uh, has been posted. It will be uh, received, will receive the proposals October 6th. Uh, a, the search committee will meet uh, and then a notice of intent to award the announcement will be made October 19th. And then on or about November 15th, a contract will be executed to, uh, for the search committee to find the next commissioner. Thank you. And we're following all due guidelines, and uh, we appreciate all the efforts. And at the same time, we expect to uh, hopefully have a rather healthy uh, group of candidates. Um, Dr. Supermanian, would you come to the mic and fill us in on because these are events that are coming up uh, oftentimes on a daily newspaper. I think it's important for the board to be aware of the changes that are going on. Good morning. Uh, as you know, for the last three years, we have been coordinating uh, campus sexual assault policies. Uh, we have been coordinating with the four systems, and each of those systems, um, they have been coordinating with their respective campuses. So we now have a uniform sexual assault policy when we started investigating um, the status of the policies across campuses back in 2014, it became apparent that there was not much uniformity. Uh, of course, 
all campuses are different, their uh, student profiles are different, but taking all of that into consideration, we still needed to have some core element, uh, some core elements in each of the policies, and now we have those. Um, as you know, the federal laws governing campus sexual assault policies, that's Title IX, as amended by the Clery Act, and there are related state laws that were uh, enacted in 2015, and the requirements on the Board of Regents and the campuses under state laws, one, the Board of Regents was required to adopt a uniform campus sexual assault policy. Uh, along with that, uh, training procedures for confidential advisors, anyone who is uh, charged with enforcing um, those investigations. So we have been doing that for the last two years in close collaboration with the systems. And this is part of a larger effort to coordinate with the systems on any uh, legal issues that affect all campuses alike. For instance, active shooter response. Um, now we have, in, at the request of the governor, we have been coordinating on the hazing policies. I'm meeting with the system liaisons in a week or so. So this is part of a larger effort to make sure that we have the right group at each of the campus, uh, campuses to activate at a moment's notice so that we have some idea of how campuses are enforcing these policies, whether, the, whether or not they're in compliance with state and federal laws. So back in 2015, when the Board of Regents adopted the Uniform uh, Sexual Assault Policy, those that policy was in compliance with state laws at the time and federal uh, laws and guidance that existed at the time. Uh, primarily, the 2011 Dear Colleague letter, <coughs> that was the primary uh, source of uh, guidance from the Federal uh, <coughs> Office of Civil Rights on how Title IX is to be implemented. And that has been, um, the state policies were shaped in because of the guidance from the federal government at the time. Uh, for the last eight months, there have been uh, many signals that the U.S. Department of Education may be changing direction um, in terms of how Title IX is to be enforced. And uh, last Friday, on the 22nd of September, the U.S. Department of Education withdrew the 2011 Dear Colleague letter and related FAQ documents that have been guiding campuses. So uh, the policies themselves, the official policies themselves are still in place. But it's the guidance on how they are to be enforced, that those are the ones that have been withdrawn. So in light of that, uh, we have been assessing how our policies and how state laws might need to be amended. At this time, we are not recommending any uh, specific changes. We are not uh, recommending suspending our policy because the state law is still in effect. Uh, but we will be assessing um, the effect of the federal guidelines on state policies and state laws, and we'll bring to you uh, some recommendations on what needs to be changed at the appropriate time. Right now, there are a few things that are reasonably clear. One is that the standard of proof by which uh, a complainant must show that there was actually an instance of sexual assault. From the preponderance of evidence requirement, um, campuses may still use that, which is the 51 more likely than not standard of proof. They may still use that, but they can also use now a higher threshold, the clear and convincing evidence. So um, the clear preponderance of evidence is not completely gone, but now campuses have some latitude on the standard of proof to be used. Mediation was not allowed um, in certain circumstances under the previous set of guidelines. Now mediation is allowed in a wider set of circumstances. So, and that's, on a, that's one of the main changes. And uh, the timeline, there was a 60-day uh, deadline for completing investigations of sexual assault. That is now gone. Um, they, they still have to resolve things, complaints, uh, investigate complaints promptly, but there is no drop dead deadline of 60 days. And uh, an appeal under previous guidelines, both parties, if, if an appeal was allowed, 
both parties must be given the right to appeal. Now it appears that either party could be given the right to appeal, but not necessarily both parties. Again, all, of, all over the country, uh, campuses are assessing the need for changes um, at the state level and at the campus level. So this, these are the things that appear to be reasonably clear at this time. You know, this is just uh, less than a week since the new guidelines came out. So we are working closely with the campuses. Uh, back in uh, August, we met with the campus um, police, chiefs of police, and we had a national speaker come address the group. Uh, we plan on, with the commissioner's uh, guidance, we are planning on having future training sessions like that. We are working on hazing uh, policies active shooter response. So again, this is just an ongoing effort at this time. We are not asking for any specific action. This is just an update. Thank you very much. And the other thing I wanted to mention, one of the few bright spots uh, from the last legislative session, uh, Senator Hewitt created an advisory council for STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, uh, and asked me to chair it. There are 29 members representing all the universities, but also workforce and industry. Uh, we're gonna meet monthly, and the goal, I think, is, a, is, a, is an ambitious goal but is to, uh, to oversee the creation, delivery, and promotion of STEM education programs, increase student interest and achievement in the fields of STEM, ensure alignment of education, economic development, industry, and workforce, and increase the number of women who graduate from a post-secondary institution. We will meet monthly. Uh, Regent Lipsy was there at the first meeting. I think uh, can attest to the fact it was both well attended and a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, from my perspective, it is also gonna allow us to, uh, to wrestle with some of the issues that we have talked about uh, before, for example, if you're trying to pursue STEM and get more people into STEM, um, we can't continue to have a 53% uh, need for remedial education when the student graduates from high school. We have to recognize those issues. You can't graduate from high school needing math and then go into a STEM field. So this is going to allow us to really, uh, I think, work through and hopefully in a positive way some of the issues that we're trying to, uh, to move forth. And lastly, we have hired a new assistant uh, commissioner for audit and compliance, Elizabeth Bourgeois. She came to us from UNO. She will serve as the chief audit review officer for the board, and that ties directly into the next and last motion that we have for the day. But thank you, unless there are questions. Thank you, Dr. Rallo. Uh, we're now under other business, item eight. The first item in this revision of the bylaws for internal operation and transaction of business for the Board of Regents for the state of Louisiana. Act 314 of the 2015 regular session requires in-house bill one that any agency receiving more than $30 million in the general appropriations bill have an internal audit function. Item 314 further requires that the Board of Regents establish an office of the chief audit executive who is responsible for ensuring that the internal audit function is up to the standard and maintains independence in accordance with the standards. In accordance with Act 314 and the Board of Regent staff's response, response to the Louisiana Legislative Auditor's 2017 audit findings, the Commissioner has established an office of the Chief Audit Executive by hiring an assistant commissioner of audit and compliance and recommends the board create an audit committee of the Board of Regents. The commissioner further recommends that the chief audit executive report to the audit committee on all matters other than day-to-day -day activities and to the commissioner on day-to-day -day activities. Therefore, Article 5.2 of the bylaws should be amended as follows to add audit committee as a standing committee whose membership shall be appointed by the chair. Do I have a motion to add an audit committee as a standing committee to the Board of Regents? Sorry. Moved by, uh, I think, uh, Mr. Seal and seconded by Mr. Markle. Is there any discussion? All in favor say aye, please. Aye. Any opposed? None opposed, motion passes. Now that the audit committee has been approved, the bylaws under section 5.2.1,
call for at least five members of the standing committee. I will announce that committee shortly within the coming week. Before we adjourn, we would like to extend our condolences to the family of Dr. Sammy Wayne Cosper, who served as the third commissioner of higher education from 1990 through 1993. Dr. Cosper passed away on September the 19th. Our next meeting will be held October 25th and 26th in Lake Charles at Southwest Louisiana Technical Community College. Please plan to travel on that Wednesday afternoon. Uh, Carolyn will be sending out details shortly about the meeting. Uh, I understand there will be a reception and then a dinner, and then we will have our meeting on the 26th. Uh, and lastly, uh, we like to wish Regent Seal tomorrow a very happy birthday. <laughs> I, won't, I don't know how many. 39. 39. Okay, well, congratulations to you. 47. Oh, he's a young man. Wow, 1947. Okay, we'll give his secrets away. Uh, also, following uh, our board meeting today, uh, there will be a board orientation for three uh, members of our board, three of the new members of our board. It will be held upstairs on the sixth floor in the commissioner's conference room, and we invite any board members here uh, that also wish to attend to please stay to that uh, uh, briefing and anybody else that would like to uh, come to the uh, briefing. Is there any other business to come before this body? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Mr. McDonald and Mr. David, seconded. We are adjourned.